video about staple foods, I talked about the various types of plants that a culture might base its cuisine around. But in these plants' raw forms, it takes a lot of chewing and digesting to get energy from them, and you won't be able to access all the possible energy anyway. Some of them can be harmful raw, and some are just kind of gross. So people tend to process their staple crops into things that are more edible, like dumplings, pasta, bread, or poi. This makes them a lot more convenient and pleasant to eat, and most importantly means they can provide more nutrients. But different cultures cook different things differently, and this affects the way they eat in general. A meal structured around a maize tortilla isn't going to be the same as one structured around rice noodles, or around cassava fufu, and the way people prepare and eat food can have wide-ranging impacts on the society. But, okay, this is such a vast topic, with so many factors going into it and so many techniques. There's mashing and grinding and pounding, and boiling and baking and fermenting, and leavening and nixtamalizing, and I don't think I can really summarise all the different ways people process food in a short video, or even a long one to be honest. So I'm just going to talk about a few broad things to consider, and things I find interesting. And I'll put some things to read in the description if you want to know more. Let's start with environmental resources. People have to cook with what's available to them. If they don't have much natural fuel, they'll probably develop cooking styles that don't require much fuel. In the grasslands of East Asia, for example, people developed methods like wok frying, which requires a lot of heat, but not for very long, and simmering and steaming, which require fairly low heat, and use water to effectively transfer heat to the food by convection. But in northwestern Europe, which used to be full of forests, fuel availability wasn't such a big issue. People could cook with big bread ovens, or keep cauldrons simmering all through the day, though often poorer people still used more efficient methods. You can also use the environment directly to help you cook. In New Zealand, the Maori developed a technique of steaming food over hot springs, or lowering it directly into the water in baskets or bags. In Iceland, lava bread is cooked in ovens buried in geothermal areas. Or you could go a completely different direction. In the Andes, people spread out potatoes in the mountains. At night, when temperatures drop below freezing, the water in the potatoes expands, bursting the cell walls. Later, the water is crushed out of them, and they become chino, basically freeze-dried potatoes. Then there are the available techniques. Adam Ragusea has a really interesting video about early cooking technologies, which I'll link here. But right now I want to talk about a theory from Dorian Fuller, about how early food processing technologies can shape preferences for thousands of years. In places where agriculture developed before pottery, grinding, roasting and baking are generally favoured. In Southwest Asia, for example, people started grinding wild grains and tubers way back in the Upper Paleolithic. When they started domesticating grains about 11,000 years ago, they kept grinding, roasting and baking them, so these methods became ingrained in their culture. When they started using pottery, they used it to complement their pre-established cuisine. They could bake bread in ceramic containers, or put clay vessels in an oven to make casseroles and shoes, and ceramics may have helped in the development of beer. But their techniques were still based around grinding, roasting and baking. In this region, breads were the staple. In Egypt and Mesopotamia, bread was part of some workers' pay. Even now, this region is known for its breads. But in places where pottery came before agriculture, tastes developed differently. Let's look at East Asia, where pottery was developed more than 11,000 years ago, at least 3,000 years before agriculture. Before grains were available in large quantities, people gathered water chestnuts, acorns and fox nuts and boiled or steamed them in pottery vessels. They did know about grinding, and often used it for things like pigments, just not as much for foods. When they gained access to large quantities of grain, they used their pre-established techniques of boiling and steaming, and the tastes and textures that were already part of their culture. When grinding is used, it's often to make things that will later be boiled or steamed anyway, like buns or noodles. That way it still matches the tastes and textures that people expect of their foods. And in some places where pottery and agriculture developed about the same time, both techniques might be present. In the Sahel region, early people developed a cuisine based on porridges and beers, which used both grinding and pottery. 
In ancient South Asia, where there was a mosaic of different agriculture and pottery traditions, both baked breads and boiled rices and millets became important as regional cuisines interacted with each other. Now, I'm not going to claim that this is necessarily true or generalizable, and in the article Fuller goes into some other claims that I'm not sure I really buy, but I do think it's an interesting pattern, and something to think about, at least with early cuisines. And cultures definitely do have their own tastes, and ways they think staple foods should be. You can see this really well when cultures interact and borrow foods from each other, they translate those foods into their own pre-existing frameworks. The first British curries were based on a British idea of Indian food. They were basically British casseroles or stews, because that was a framework people were familiar with, but with a few extra ingredients to make it Indian. Extremely hot spices, like coriander and black pepper. Even now, British curries tend to be richer and involve more meat than similar foods eaten in India. In Japan, the word for bread is pan. It comes from Portuguese traders, who introduced bread in the 1600s. Japanese bread is often stuffed with fillings, and it tends to be sweeter, softer and moister than European breads. Maybe the texture is different so that it's closer to traditional steamed foods, and so it fits in better to the pre-existing framework. Finally, all of these food processing techniques require labour, sometimes a lot of it, though that does depend on the crop and what you're doing with it. So who's doing that labour, and who's benefiting from it? When the food's for one household, it's often women who have to spend long, boring hours processing it. You can occasionally see the effects on ancient skeletons. In richer households or commercial productions, this labour often fell to lower class servants or enslaved people. Things like mills can be super important economically, because they free up so much labour for a resource that everyone needs, but access to them often isn't equal. And in general, people with high status like to eat food that takes a lot of labour to make, just not their own. Often in Europe, poorer people would eat bread made of coarsely ground grain, sometimes with lower calorie legume flour added for extra volume, while richer people ate fine, soft white bread. To make the bread light and airy, servants had to grind the flour incredibly fine. This took hours of work, and wasted a lot of edible grain. Sometimes crusts were scraped off partway through baking, because rich people's stomachs were just too delicate to handle them. Nowadays though, soft white bread can be mass-produced, so it isn't a very good marker of prestige anymore. Crusty, artisanal breads are the fancy ones, because they look like they took effort to make, and white bread is considered bland and unsophisticated. Like I said earlier, this is a huge topic with so many factors and interesting stories attached, and there's no way I can cover them all here. My next video in this series should be putting all this into practice in my worlds. Maybe I'll make a second course on this topic in the real world someday, but I hope that's enough to whet your appetite for now.